took a little detour last week for prayer night, and we talked a little bit about worship and, and, and presence, and it was very good. Uh, we didn't record it. I made a statement concerning that, that I wanted to just touch on very briefly. It's not the, the reason I'm up here tonight, but, you know, some things bear repeating and bear a little deeper exposition. Um, I was referring to how prayer in, t prayer in the Holy Ghost could be, for lack of a better term, this isn't the best word to use because it's really not possible, but how, based on your heart, how praying in the Holy Ghost can be abused in our fellowship and our private time with Christ as a tool to avoid focusing our mind in our worship. Because when we come before God in our personal prayer time, our personal devotion, whatever you want to call it, we should bring all of our faculties to bear. And we should make a concerted effort to focus ourselves on God and leave no part of ourselves out of the conversation. When you pray in the Holy Spirit, it's, it's the most effective prayer for speaking the mysteries of the kingdom of God because you give yourself over to the Holy Spirit to pray through you the will of God. And you cannot develop spiritually without praying in the Holy Ghost. So I don't want to undermine or discount the value of praying in the Holy Ghost. There is no way to develop your faith or to develop on your faith, rather, without praying in the Holy Spirit. However, you can pray in the Holy Ghost for three hours a day, and that's wonderful if you do. There is no degree where you can pray in the Holy Ghost too much. But if you neglect to bring your mind into the equation, you're leaving out an essential part of worship. You're leaving out an essential part of fellowship with God. You see, David didn't pray in the Holy Spirit. Yet he wrote a, an entire volume's worth of effective prophetic prayer because it was the nature of his heart. It was the desire of his heart to know God. So he spoke in his language, in his, from his understanding, his heart to God, and he prepared his worship. And he didn't have tongues. And I think what we do sometimes is we look at all of the privileges that we have. Tongues is a privilege that David never had. He couldn't even imagine it. And a privilege is meant to be built on top of a foundation of things. It's not meant to replace it. You're not supposed to pray in tongues and continue to pray in tongues and continue to pray in tongues. But then when you, your heart has something to say that you can understand, you neglect to say it. Any more than you would walk up to a brother or sister in Christ and pray in tongues to him for 10 minutes and then walk away. Paul mentions this. The understanding has value. It has value to you and it has value to whoever you're talking to because that has to be heard by God in your language and then released through your mouth so that you can agree with it. So there's value. When I go into worship, I rely on tongues, but I also rely on my understanding. I make an effort to pray in English my heart unto God. I make an effort to do it because it forces my mind to focus on where we are and who we're talking to. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, sometimes your mind can wander. And the wandering of your mind doesn't change the effectiveness of your tongues. But it does leave your mind out of the conversation. And if you've ever prayed in tongues for a long time and your mind starts to wander, you can, you're, you're familiar with the, the battle sometimes to bring it back in to submission. You try to focus on the godly things and you're trying to think about the word and things like that because it really has nothing to do. Part of bringing your mind under subjection is bringing your mouth under subjection. And the same way you are responsible for speaking the word in 
a situation or a circumstance, like healing or finances. You're responsible for speaking the word in fellowship. It's the same responsibility. So one doesn't supersede the other. They are both valuable for proper fellowship with God. And I wanted to make that point again because I made it last week, but I want to make it again because I never want you to think that we're undermining the value of tongues. It's not about tongues. It's about your ability to focus, your desire to speak your heart unto God. What I do is I start in English my heart. I take a few minutes and I, I'm completely silent before the Lord. When I go into, into prayer and fellowship with God, I turn off all distractions, anything that's going to distract me from where I am and who I'm with. I turn off my distractions, and then I take the opportunity to hear in my own spirit what I want to say to the Lord. And it's always worship. It's never, Lord, I got this going on, I got that going on, Lord, I'm worried about this, Lord, this, this bill is due. It's not any of that because that's not why I'm here. It's not why I'm there. I'm not there for that. I'm there to express to the Lord my love, my, my devotion, my honor, my worship. And when I run out of things to say, then I go into tongues. And that might be another hour. Because now I'm, I'm digging deeper into the spirit than my mind can go. But I've brought my mind into this conversation. I subjected my mind first. Sometimes when I don't have anything to say, I go to the book of Psalms. And I'll read chapters worth of Psalms to the Lord. You can't do better than that. But I want to make sure that every part of my faculties is in on this conversation because I'm seeking God. Because I'm, 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 I'm obsessed with knowing him. And I don't want to leave any part of me out of the conversation. I don't want to just say, well, I prayed in tongues, so Lord, your will be done. I'm going about my business. You know when you're hungry for something, you, you pay whatever it costs. And there's a cost to good fellowship. And we can, we can abuse the, we can put the responsibility of good fellowship on God when the responsibility is on us. If I come to Brother Joe and I say, Brother Joe, I want to spend some time with you. I just, I'm not going to tell him, hey, invite me to your house and cook me dinner. If I want to hang out with him, I say, hey, I want to take you out to dinner. I'll come pick you up. I make the effort if I want to fellowship with him. If I want to fellowship with him, I don't tell him I want to fellowship with you, so when you're ready, call me over and cook dinner for me. I don't make him do the work for the fellowship. If it's his, if it's his presence that I'm chasing, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to pay the cost. Don't leave any part of yourself out of the conversation, out of the fellowship. You must... Pray in tongues. You must pray in the Holy Ghost. But you also must bring your mind under subjection. Confessions have the same air to them. That's why we have certain confessions that we do, because they're English words that we can understand that focus our mind on the word and the will of God. So we are saying things on purpose in order to focus ourselves on what God wants to hear. If everything you say it was in tongues, your spirit would be speaking mysteries of the kingdom of God, and they would be more true than anything you could think up. But they wouldn't really help you much. That's why God gives us interpretation of tongues at times, so that we can then go back and speak in our understanding the word and the will of God. So that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight, but I want to make sure that I, I, I touch that again because it's, that's a practical technique. Sometimes when, if you can master fellowship, Christianity is easy. If you can master fellowship, if that time you spend with the Lord first thing in the morning, which I recommend, because if you put God first in your day, it's easier to put him first in your life. That time that you spend with God, if you can master that moment, however long that moment is, if you can master that, Christianity is a lot easier. And a lot of times, we have a routine we go through, and then we get up and we, and we go about our life. And we haven't actually fellowshiped with God yet. You, you, if you've ever really fellowshiped with God, it marks you in a way that you can't, you're not happy anywhere else. It doesn't mean, happy is the wrong word. You're not satisfied anywhere else. I can be happy doing other things. I'm happy hanging out with my wife and my friends and, and 
enjoying it, my hobbies and things like that. But there's this hole. There's this hunger all the time. I can't wait to get back in the presence of God. And it never goes away. It doesn't matter what I'm doing, what I have, who I'm with. I can enjoy that moment in all of its greatness, but when I'm quiet, there's this gnawing hunger to be back in the presence of God. And throughout the day, I have to go satisfy that hunger. You need to search for that hunger. The more of God you get, the more of God you want. And if you can, if you can be satisfied with your morning devotions and go all day till the next morning and do your devotions and then go all day to the next morning and do your devotions, if that can satisfy you, your hunger might not be there. Your hunger, I remember dad talking about when he first got saved. When he first got born again, he locked himself in his apartment and just prayed for hours on end. And he was a new baby Christian. There's a hunger that comes when you desire God. And so much of what we're doing now was birthed out of that early moment. Years, decades before all of this. It always begins with hunger and fellowship. It always begins there. So when you're really hungry for something, you commit all of your faculties to it. Don't abuse the privilege of tongues because David would out-worship most everybody in this room. And he never had tongues. Just something to think about. All right. Now let's get back to what we were talking about. That was my little detour. That was on my heart. And now it's been spoken. And now it's been live streamed. So unless the Lord says otherwise, I don't have to say it again next week. We've been on the subject of belief. And we've been talking about, I, I, I gave this title, and I don't remember if I said it more than once, but I'm going to say it again just in case. Uh, belief, the measuring tool of your faith. Just in case you need a title. I realized I don't really be titling my stuff, and Dad was very good about titling everything. And so it made it easy to, to go back and look at the title and see what he was talking about that week. I, I have to get better at that. Please bear with me. I never really title stuff. But we're titling this one, Belief, the Measuring Tool of Your Faith. And we've been on this for several weeks now. And uh, we've been talking about the, the fellowship with a belief or with a thought or with an idea that creates belief in us. And how when you fellowship with the truth, it creates a belief system. And how fellowship takes time, it takes effort, it takes investment to become belief. It's not overnight, it's not instantaneous. There has to be a foundation laid for a belief to stick. For it to become a belief, there has to be a foundation laid. And that foundation can take time depending on how soft your heart is, depending on where your heart is. We talked about Jesus' the parable of the sower and how the stony ground heart was particularly uh, commonplace, especially in the church, because the stony ground heart has all of the makings of good soil except for one problem. There are parts of it that won't move. And if you've ever tried to plant any plant, any tree, those roots go deep before you see the plant. And they can only, the plant is only as healthy and as solid as the roots are able to move the soil around it. When you plant a tree, it tries its best to move the soil where it can get the most nutrient and where it can be the most stable. If you put it in stone, it can't break through stone as easily. So the tree suffers. And while you may see some growth, like Jesus said in the parable, as soon as it's challenged, as soon as the sun beats down on it, because it doesn't have roots, not because it doesn't have some plant, not because there's no shoots, but because there's no roots, stone prevents roots. Stone prevents a change of belief system. It's not about agreement at this point. He says in the parable that when the word is sown, the person who receives the, the word on their stony heart receives it gladly. They are not objecting to the word. They agree with it. But they have systems in their spirit, systems in their heart that are belief systems that they won't let the word move. 
And because the word can't move those things, it can't root. This is most common in the church. I would say it's more common than thorny. It's more common than wayside. Because we come to church to hear things most of the time. And if I preach something you 100% agree with without any resistance, you'll get results. But if I preach something that hits a rock, I preach something that hits a stone, a belief system that you have, almost always we see a little bit of excitement and a little bit of movement, and then it never becomes, it never flourishes. We don't see fruit. That's because beliefs pre, were already pre-existing in that heart. And I have to be able to, any preacher who is going to be effective at preaching, when the word is preached, that word has to be able to break your belief systems down. You can believe something that is not, I'm going to say this right, not biblically averse. In other words, it's not anti-Bible, but it's an ineffective doctrine in your life. And you can have such a foundation in it that no matter what word you hear and what the word tries to change in you, it has, you, have to, you try to make it fit a belief system you've always had in spite of the fact that you don't have any results from it. You believe things for 20 years, you still don't see. There's still no fruit. There's still no fruit for it, but you've locked it in as a given. This is, this is law in my heart. And, it's, and, it, and it may be that the word needs to change or adjust or reduce your, your emphasis on that for a season. But because you have this stone in the way, your beliefs don't change. You have the faith because the faith comes in the word. But, you, but your belief is, is wrong. And your belief is how your faith is measured. I could tell how much of your faith gets to go to work, not by how much word you know, not by how much seed you have, but by how stony or loose your heart is. So how do I recognize a stony belief system? How do I recognize an ineffective belief system? Well, we talked about one right there. There's no fruit for it. What's an ineffective belief system? Let me give you an example of an ineffective belief system. I'm going to turn my pages real quick. And while I'm doing that, I was uh, conversing with the Lord, and he, he gave me this little, this little he, well, he gave me this perspective of him that I had never uh, I'm looking for it because it was so beautiful. Yeah, there it is. You know, one thing that we believe about God, well, most of our false belief systems are false beliefs about God. I'll just say that. Most of the time, we believe right about ourselves but wrong about God. And he was saying, he said, son, I can't do anything small. He said, there is an entire universe of complexity inside every single atom. He said, I can't even do small, small. That made me laugh, because I thought about it. I began to meditate on it. He said, you know, I don't do anything small. He said, you know, there's a whole field of physics called quantum mechanics, quantum physics, that just deals with the physics of microscopic things, subatomic particles. And the more they dig, the smaller they go, the more complex it gets. It doesn't get simpler like you would think it would get. It's equally as complex in the subatomic realm as it is in the stars and the galaxies. He said, because every aspect of me is big. He said, I can't do small, small. And I, and I thought about that. And I said, you know, if that's true, then help me to find your mark, your standard in everything. Because there's, God has a signature. When it's God, there's a signature. Even in the small, simple things, God has a signature. So I'm looking for his signature in everything because I was in prayer and I was wrestling because I, didn't, I, I was looking for a sensing I wasn't getting. And I said, Lord, I said, where am I? 
right now. You know, I've been digging, I've been searching, I've been specifically looking for a deeper fellowship. And he said, he said, it doesn't matter where you are if you're with me. And he put me to Psalm 23. He said, you know, your focus should be on me, not on you when you're fellowshipping. So it's, it's not about where you are, it's about where I am. He said, and I'm always in my word. So when you feel lost in your fellowship, go to my word until you find me. I'll be there. I keep coming back on this fellowship thing. I'm trying to stay on belief. But every time I start talking about belief, fellowship comes out. And that's because belief is a product of fellowship. Everything you believe comes from something or someone you fellowship with long enough until it created a law in your heart. So it's hard to talk about belief without talking about proper fellowship. Because so much of what's wrong with us is poor fellowship. It's, poor, it's like poor diet has so many consequences on your body. And you'll take this medicine and that medication and you'll try this trick and that, that idea to try to fix a dietary, a, a problem caused by a malnutrition in this area or a lack of vitamin in that area or too much of something in that area. It, it's always the thing you do every day that makes us. And if we had a room where everybody's fellowship was right, it would be so easy for the spirit of God to just manifest because we'd all be looking for it. And not just looking for it in some tangible way, but searching for it from our heart. Searching for it from the deepest parts of ourselves, where it's just like, I'm never going to be satisfied until God manifests in me. And if everybody in the room had that same mindset, oh, God could do anything he wanted. God could do anything he wanted. And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're praying for. We're praying for new moves of God. But we've got these belief systems up and running that challenge when God wants to move because we are telling God how we think he should move. See, see, you don't get to determine the move. You just get to seek it. And a lot of times, because we are so need-focused, we feel like God hasn't moved until this need has been addressed that we came in with. Oh, I came in with this financial need. So if God's going to move, there's going to be a, a prosperity. I came in with a physical need. So if God moves, there's going to be healing. And I don't want to misinform you. God always answers those things. But he answers them with his word first. And his word does whatever his word is going to do before you see the fruit. And a lot of times, we're so busy chasing the fruit, we don't allow the root. So when you plant an apple tree, you, don't, you shouldn't plant an apple tree when you want an apple. You plant an apple tree when you want an apple tree. If you want an apple, you go to the store and buy an apple. If every time you were hungry, you planted a seed, <laughs> and you went through the process of nurturing the ground, and watering, and irrigation, and, and protecting it from predators, and watching the little bud grow, and then you gotta wait so long for that bud to grow, and then you gotta wait for it to get so big, and then you gotta trim it, and you gotta hedge around it, and you gotta fertilize, it, and you gotta do all of that before you see the first apple. You die of starvation waiting on that first apple. And a lot of times, we're dying on the star of starvation before we see the fruit, because we don't want an apple tree. We just want an apple. And so we, but, but when we go to God for an apple, he gives us a seed called his word. And we don't want a seed. We don't want to change the soil to produce an eternal process of apple for us for the rest of our lives. We don't want that. We just want an apple. I got bills, and I got bills now. So, Lord, since I have bills, I need you to help me with these bills today. And God says, here's prosperity in a seed. Now, you're going to have to grow this seed. You're going to have to protect it. Now, when you plant this seed in your heart, you got a rock that you're going to have to move out the way for that seed to grow. That rock is strife. That rock is, I don't trust my spouse with money. So when extra money comes in, we get a stimulus check, tax return, bonus on the job. When extra money comes in, I want to know everything you're going to do with it. I want to keep most of it and stick it in the savings account. 
because I don't really trust my spouse with money. I've seen them mess up too many times with money. I don't trust them. So let's, let's, so then we argue back and forth to see how we're going to deal with this money. We're going to split it up. How are we going to split it up? We, and, and we try to sit on it because, you know, bad things can happen. Anything can happen. And I'm being responsible. I'm trying to be a good steward. So I'm, I'm being guided by this stone I have in my heart, this belief, because I have bad experiences with my spouse being bad with money. So then God comes along to your spouse and says, sow half of that into the ministry. Give me half of that. And your spouse comes to you and says, babe, look, we got to sow this. You only hear your spouse being bad with money because that's your stone, right? Now, the word has been planted. Pastor Diana got up here, preached laws of prosperity for 27 years. There's 27 years of prosperity seed planted. And every time the seed gets planted, it's trying to break the roots. The roots, the word is always working. You got to understand. But when the word works, when you go to the word for something, watch this. When you go to the word for something, you're inviting the word to do what it does, not do what you want it to do. And one of the mistakes we make is we, we find a healing scripture when we need healing. And we say, okay, healing scripture, heal me. Isaiah 53, heal me. But then Isaiah 53 starts talking about stuff that has to do with your love life. Or the Lord is talking to you about stuff that has to do with your giving. Or your children. Or that, that co-worker you don't like. The word is trying to create an environment where it's comfortable so that it can fruit inside of you. The fruit of the word is going to be everything in the word, including your healing, your prosperity, all that stuff, right? But we just want the fruit. We don't want the tree. And so because we don't want the tree, we switch. Okay, I I planted this, this money seed a year ago, and I'm still broke. So let me go back to the drawing board and get me some new seed. Oh, I was standing on Deuteronomy 8. Now I'm going to stand on Deuteronomy 8, and I'm going to stand on, give me a prosperity scripture. I'm going to stand on Luke 6, 38. That's right, I didn't give enough, so I'm going to give some more. Nothing wrong with giving. But Deuteronomy 8 was trying to break seed, was trying to break roots into your heart. And because, the, see, the word of God is alive. It's not a book of rules. It's God in written form. So it's just as alive as God is. You understand? So if I go, I hired a personal trainer a few months ago. And she's, she tells us, she says, okay, look, you're going to have to do cardio three days a week. And you're going to have to lift weight three days a week. And this is the maximum number of calories you can eat a day. And this is how many carbs you can eat. And this is how much fat you can eat. And this is how much protein. You have to get this many grams of protein every day for the next year. And if you do this for a year, this is how much weight you'll lose, this is how much muscle mass you'll have, and everything. Right? I didn't know any of that. I've been at Planet Fitness for a year just messing around, right? <laughs> getting sweaty, coming home, not getting any better, right? They got my money. It won't that much. $10 a month. You can't really beat that. But after a year of doing it, it's in the same shape. So I went to the trainer. Here's the revelation that me and my wife got. I said, babe, I have the will to change, to, to adapt, but I don't know what I'm doing. So I need to bring someone into my situation who is living my life that I want. They have the body I want. And I don't go to them and say, give me muscles. Right? Because they know my body better than I know it. They have knowledge. They have experience. They have training. They have understanding. And then when they come to me, they tell me stuff that has nothing to do with the gym. If I lose a couple of pounds and then I plateau, they don't say, all right, we're going to start picking up more weight. Because that's my thought. Oh, I got to lift more weight now. That's all I know. Lift more weight. Right? Guys are like that, right? 
just the more weight I lift, the stronger I get. No, that's not what she said. She said, oh, the problem is your carb protein balance is off. So let me adjust your macros so that you're getting this much protein now and this many carbs. And after a couple of weeks of that, the rocket engine started back up, weight started dropping off again. No, I wouldn't have done that. What, what I did, and what I'm doing, is submitting to her process. Because I don't just want muscles. I want the manifestation of what she's able to do in my body. You understand? In that example, she's like the word. When you go to the word, the word's going to attack what's broken. It's not going to give you what you asked for. It's going to get, it's going to fix what's broken. Jesus said in Mark 11 that what things wherever you desire when you pray, believe that you received it and you shall have it. Believing you receive it is the key part of that scripture. We've all prayed for stuff we wanted. We got desire on lock. We got prayer on lock. We learned how to pray. So why don't we always get what we want when we pray? Because our belief system doesn't match somewhere. Now watch this. Believe that you receive it doesn't just mean I believe that I have this thing. I thought that too. I thought that if I needed a new car, I go to God and I say, Lord, I need a new car. I believe that I have it. I receive my car in Jesus' name. I believe I have a car. Right? We've all done that. And we dig deep. We look inside. Lord, do I have any challenges to, you know, okay, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to set this money aside and I'm going to do this. I'm going to make this move and I'm going to give a little bit of something and I'm going to sew for a car and all that. And all that's great. That's great technique. But, like I said before, if I'm out of love with my wife, or I've got strife in my, or my fellowship is off. The word, here's what God does. He takes your car, okay, and he, he's already set it aside for you long before you even came to him about it. And he says, okay, are they where they need to be for this car to be a blessing or a curse? If they are where they need to be for this car to be a blessing, the car is theirs. Now, this is built into the word. This is not God the Father making these decisions on hand. This is all built into the word. We're going to talk about that later because you've got to learn the anatomy of God. But the word is making these moves in the word. When you apply the word to situation, this is what the word does. The word calculates whether this manifestation is going to be a blessing or a curse. If it's a blessing... You've got it. If it's a curse, he moves you to blessing. He never says no. He just begins to move you. And this is where it takes 20 years for some of us. Because he attacks something. He attacks your carbs. And you think, I just need more weight up. So you dig deeper into lifting weights, thinking that's got to be the answer because I know lifting weights makes you stronger. I got a little word on this, and I've been preaching this for 20 years. This got to be the way I'm going to get it. But he's coming for your carbs. And when he comes for that, you don't, ah, uh, nah, that's a stone in your heart. Oh, but when you surrender your beliefs, when you surrender yourself and say, look, if this word was working in me, I'd have had it by now. That's a hard conversation to have sometimes. Because some stuff we've been standing on for a long time. And we've made up new rules about why we don't have it yet. But when I read the word, I see a lot of instantaneous. Now, there are some things that took a long time. It took centuries for some things to happen. But if you notice, it, it was always because God had to move a man. And it can take centuries to move men. It don't take centuries to move God. It shouldn't take you 10 years to move God for financial prosperity. Our standard has gone down because time erodes our standard. Time without manifestation lowers our standard. We start settling for stuff that when we started, we wouldn't settle for. Because what we're really doing 
is protecting a belief we've had that we don't want to change. So we start rewriting the rules as we go. <laughs> we start rewriting the rules. Well, some things take 25 years. No. First of all, you've got to understand something. Nothing that you're praying and believing for has to be done. It's already been done. It's got nothing to do with God having to move. That's a, that's a religious falsity. Because if God has to move, then, then the cross wasn't complete. And if the cross was complete, which it was, which it is, then there's nothing more. He can't do no more than he did on the cross. I need you to understand, God can do no more for you than he did on the cross. If the cross didn't cover it, it ain't for you. So once you settle that in your mind, the question is not, what does God have yet to do for me? The question is, where is God? And where am I in relation to him? And what's keeping me from being where he is on this situation? Okay, I've had this belief about, about money for forever. Okay. Has it worked? No. How do I know it hasn't worked? Because I believe in four million dollars and I ain't got a 10. So if my faith is right and my belief is right, now faith is easy. Faith comes when you hear the word. We all got enough faith for a million dollars. Everybody in this room got the faith for it. But you might not be believing it. And I can tell your belief system by the stuff you defend, not by the stuff you say. You got a sacred cow you're defending that you can hide under the stuff you say. But until I can break that rock, it might be something your grandmama told you. It might be a way you see yourself. You might be insecure. You know, insecurity is a belief system that we protect more than anything else. God might be trying, you know, before you get rich, there might be an insecurity you got to overcome. Because maybe God doesn't want to just give you a million dollars and then you go live in a cabin somewhere with a million dollars. That's your plan. But maybe God wants to make you stick you out front in front of everybody. Because that's what God made you. You know, the other day, me and the Lord were having a conversation. And he said, he took me to Matthew 6. You know, I'm quoting a lot of scripture. I haven't told you to turn to anything yet. And sometimes I do that because most of my Fellowship with God is conversational, and he jumps me around the Bible. So if you pick up on these scriptures, I'm, these references I'm giving you, that's why you got to take notes, because I don't have time to read them all, right? But I promise you it's all in there. He took me to Matthew 6, and he took me to where Jesus is saying, consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how they don't toil or spin or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. The Lord said to me, he said, when it came to provision, when it came to finances, Jesus had the same relationship with God that the birds did. And I said, oh, you got to explain that one to me. He said, birds don't have any industry for self-sufficiency. If God doesn't feed them, they don't eat. That was Jesus. Jesus had no industry for self-sufficiency. If God didn't take care of them, he died. He didn't eat. He didn't have anything. That was Jesus' revelation, see. He was not self-sufficient. He was completely God-dependent. Now, the method in which God chose to prosper him was up to God. It wasn't up to Jesus. It was up to God. If that was, you're going to do this for a living, and, and replace Jesus with you, because, you know, he's talking to us about it. He would surrender. You're supposed to surrender the method of your provision to God, because you're not your own provider. But humans made a mistake. Humans think that self-sufficiency is a sign of adulthood, and it's not. Self-sufficiency is a sign of childhood. Children want to do everything for themselves, even though they can do nothing for themselves. Right? What's the one thing all children want to do? They want to be adults, because they think being an adult is I get to do stuff for myself. But then when you become an adult, all you want is somebody to take care of you. <laughs> right? You don't know how easy you got it when you were a kid. I didn't. Didn't realize how easy I had it. Because what's the cost of being taken care of? Obedience. You got to be told what to do and where to go. You can't wear that. You can't go there. Be home by this time. That's the cost. We don't want to pay the cost. We want the same degree of being taken care of with the autonomy of adulthood. I want to go where I want. 
when I want, how I want, where and what I want, with who I want, but you got to take care of me. We call that teenager. That's why nobody likes teenagers, right? <laughs> That's why nobody likes teenagers, because they haven't figured that out. You got to give something up to get that kind of freedom in, in the flesh, right? Well, see, Jesus was explaining, to his, he was explaining to his disciples, he said, look, birds and plants, they do what they were made to do. They don't do what they want to do. They do what they were made to do, and because they're, what, they're doing what they're made to do, God takes care of them. They weren't made to gather in the barns and to till the fields and to grow. They weren't made to do that. So they don't. And their food is always abundant. You know, if you're an eagle, watch this. This is what the Lord said to me. He said, son, if you're an eagle and you come to me, I'm going to talk to you like an eagle. I'm not going to talk to you like the horse you want to be. Just because you went to horse college and took horse classes and you watch horses your whole life and you like that and you see how horses get treated, so you want to be a horse. You think you're a horse. He said, but when you come to me, because I made you, if I made you an eagle, every revelation I give you is for eagles. I'm not going to give you horse revelation because it ain't for you. I'm not going to give you horse time, horse ability, horse provision, because it's not for you. You're an eagle. If you want my provision, unlimited provision, you want my prosperity, be the eagle I made you, not the horse you want to be. See, our belief systems come from our own lust. They come from something that we chased before we knew God. And then when we come to God, we try to get God to provide for us for the things we brought him. And we never have that moment where we say, Lord, what, was, what is your design for me? And then we wonder why prosperity doesn't work. It's not prosperity that fails. You're just, you're just trying to be a horse when you're an eagle. Hmm. But if your love is for God, I'm going back to fellowship again. If our fellowship is good, something changes. Here's what changes when your fellowship changes. You only want God to be happy. You know, I've been, I've been reading Oswald Chambers, and if, if you get a chance, you need to. Um, my utmost for his highest. Oh, it's a beautiful book. It brings tears to my eyes, some, some of the parts that I read. It's amazing revelation from this man. If you get a chance, you need to get a copy and just study the whole thing. It's a daily devotional, but I read it a month at a time because I'm just absorbing it, right? But there's this theme throughout the book where he talks about complete and utter surrender, where you have no agenda whatsoever. You just want God to be happy. And that's recurrent throughout the book. And then I go to David, and I read in Psalms where he has the same hunger. I just want you to be happy. I don't care about me. I just want you to be happy. See, now that's an eagle laying the horse down. If you made me an eagle, you'll be happiest when I'm an eagle. So I'm going to be an eagle. And then once I start flying, my joy comes from your joy. My joy comes from you, and my provision comes from you. I'm looking at all this grass, and I'm trying to figure out why I can't get any. I see all these horses eating it, and I want some. But every time I try to get some, I can't get the grass. So I struggle with these little pieces of grass that my talons can pick up. This is a very visual analogy. Oh, but there's an ocean full of fish that I can grab easily. See, you're chasing grass when you're an eagle. But there's an ocean full of fish that God put there for you to eat, and you don't pick no fish up. And you say prosperity doesn't work. No, there's plenty of prosperity for eagles in the ocean, because that's where their food is. That's why David says, don't fret yourself when evildoers prosper. That's why he says that. He says, don't get mad when you see the the wicked get money. He says, that's going to fade away. They're, They're not prospering. They just have money. Prosperity is everlasting because it comes from God. That's why eagles always got food. Jesus reiterates this principle in Matthew 6, where he says, take no thought for your life. Consider the birds and the lilies of the field. He's he's bringing attention to purpose, not provision. 
because provision is automatic. Our belief systems are often born out of lust, puts us out of, out of place. You know, when your measuring system is wrong, when you use poor measurements, one of two things happens, waste or insufficiency. If you ever cooked anything and you measured something incorrectly, you will, you will either have waste or insufficiency. When your belief system is broken or damaged or loaded up with stones, whatever you want to call it, your faith is going to be wasted or it's going to be insufficient. You have faith. Every single one of you was given the measure of faith at, at, at your new birth when you were born again. Your belief systems have to be changed into the word for you to prosper. Nothing that can be preached from this pulpit is going to matter if it can't break your stone up. I'm not going to preach myself hoarse trying to change your mind. I know mama's not. We're not going to beat ourselves up trying to break through. We're going to give you the word and let the word plant in your heart. And when it starts touching on stuff that has nothing to do with what you're asking about, your beliefs are being challenged. Let that happen. Let the word create roots that crack through all that stuff that you believe. What's of God will last and what isn't will fade away. Amen? I didn't get to half of my notes, but it ain't my fault. I believe, in closing, that we are at a pivotal moment in our history both as a church, as a family, and as the church. And one of the things that happens when we get to moments like this is we start looking forward. And we start looking so forward that we stop looking up. We stop looking at God. The best place to be in moments like this is completely focused on the presence and the voice of God. Because that's where you're going to be protected from all the temptation that's about to come when we turn this corner. Prominence breeds new temptation. Opportunity breeds new temptation. And you don't overcome temptation with discipline. You overcome it with fellowship. Be wary of that because we're getting there. More than, we, than you realize. That's why God is so heavy on this fellowship thing. Why he's so heavy on it? Because he wants us focused back on him. And we will do it. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Let's go home. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that this word has come forth with power and demonstration, signs following, Lord, and that those signs are effective in transforming the hearts and the minds of those who receive. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your love, your everlasting mercy, your renewed long-suffering with us every single day, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your divine protection, according to Psalms 91, that your angels are charged over us to keep and watch us from all hurt, harm, or danger, seen or unseen, until we come again together on Sunday morning, Lord, around your word, and in praise and worship and fellowship with you and with each other. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have for us and all that you have for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this broadcast. Now, we don't want you to miss when we go live again. So sign up for Rapture Go. Text the Rapture to 797979. Again, it's the word Rapture to 797979. We'll send you a text message the very next time we go live. Now, if you don't live in the United States, instead go to our website, raptureministries.org, and sign up for our mailing list, and we'll let you know the next time we go live with a new broadcast. Thank you for watching.